right, Brendan, we'll get stuck into it straight away. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we've got 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, first, I'd like to ask you, I know the audience probably knows about, a bit about Itochu. Sure. It's a massive organization. Perhaps you can just give us an overview of your global operations and particularly your presence in Australia. Please. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Alex. And uh, thank you to IMAC for the invitation uh, to, to come in and speak today. Um, so, yeah, for those who are not familiar with Itochu, uh, we're one of Japan's uh, largest uh, trading and investment houses. Uh, we have a very uh, long history going back uh, more than 150 years. Uh, we have a very diversified uh, business, um, starting at, with investments in upstream uh, mining assets and all the way through to uh, retail business, um, especially uh, in Japan. Uh, so right through the, um, the supply chain. Um, in Australia, uh, we also have a very long history. Um, Itochu Australia was established in 1957. Uh, so uh, we have three offices now uh, and a, a range of, of businesses in Australia. Um, some of those major businesses are our, our machinery business, uh, which has um, an investment in a desalinization plant in Victoria and in, uh, in passenger trains up in Queensland. Uh, we also trade various things, food and forestry products and, and other uh, general products. Uh, and then we have our resources business, which is, is where I'm affiliated uh, with. Uh, so at the moment we have uh, investments with BHP in their iron ore business in Western Australia. We, we have 8% of that. Uh, we have investments in a, a coking coal mine in Queensland, 20% uh, of that mine uh, and 15% uh, in, in another coal mine here in New South Wales. We also have an investment in Indonesia, um, uh, which uh, is held uh, out of our Australian uh, subsidiary uh, with, um, with uh, Palmer. And I see I have a couple of representatives uh, from Palmer here uh, today. So thank you for, for coming. Uh, we very much um, value that relationship. Uh, and then more recently, in sort of building off those existing um, investments that we have, we've been looking at making investments in uh, the decarbonisation space, uh, including in hydrogen. Um, last year, we, we made a cornerstone investment in a company called MCI Carbon, which, which has a, um, a carbon capture utilisation technology, uh, which we hope uh, we can roll out to, to some of our, um, uh, our customers in, uh, in Japan and, and other places. We're also involved in a hydrogen project uh, at the Dalrymple Bay terminal, uh, which, uh, as many of you may know, is a, a currently a coal export terminal up near Mackay. Uh, so there's a consortium of, of ourselves, um, Dalrymple Bay Infrastructure, who is the, uh, the, the leaseholder and the owner of the terminal infrastructure, uh, Brookfield Infrastructure, uh, who is the largest shareholder of, of Dalrymple Bay Infrastructure. Uh, and then North Queensland Bolt Ports, who's at the state government owned um, uh, corporation, which is the Port Authority up there. Um, and yeah, we're, we're looking at uh, various other uh, ways we can invest into hydrogen in Australia, okay. but that's probably our main project. No, that, that's great, Brendan. Um, look, it's clear that Detochu is committed to decarbonisation and the energy transition with hydrogen. I must say, though, because I've been around for a while. Um, and I remember the studies back in 2017 by yes. the South Australian government about opportunities in SA. That's five years ago. And unfortunately, we haven't seen anything develop to fruition. And I think there's, there's a lot of anxiety, I guess, now that a lot of organisations are just doing feasibility studies and it stops. So my question to you is what needs to happen for companies like Itochu to not necessarily just do feasibility studies, but actually invest, you know, potentially billions yes. in Australia. And I'd like your view on that, what impediments need to be removed yep. and how Australia competes for capital of other countries in the world. Where are we on the pecking order? Uh, yeah, so uh, very good question. Um, answer the, the, the last part first about how we see Australia. Um, Obviously, you know, as it is mentioned, we've got a very long history in Australia. We're very familiar, uh, and other, you know, of our Japanese counterparts as well um, have invested here for a long time. So we're very familiar with, you know, with the, the business environment, uh, with the legal framework. Uh, you know, we have uh, offices here. So from that perspective, Australia is a, a good place to invest in. If we talk about hydrogen specifically, um, obviously we have very good renewable resources here. 
uh, where close to certainly what Itochu sees as our key markets in Japan and, and Asia. Uh, and you know we have um, a workforce at you know the, in the resources and energy sector, which, which um, uh, is a skilled workforce and and can hopefully be used uh, for hydrogen as well. Um, so that's great. Yeah. Uh, the issue then about you know competitiveness between Australia and other jurisdictions is where it gets a bit interesting. Uh, you know, you mentioned about a lot of a lot of studies happening in the last few years. Um, I think uh, you know uh, that's great, and you know the Australian government and, and various state governments have been supporting that with with grant funding. Um, but really, to take it to the next step, where you know we're going to see large scale export projects. Um, at the moment, they're, they're not economic. I don't think any of those studies have come out and said, yes, let's, let's push the button on a, a decision to invest. Um, and we really probably need to see um, yeah, some government assistance to, to make, make that leap, I think. Um, yeah. You know, we saw uh, in the last couple of months the US uh, Inflation Reduction Act come into effect with, with huge subsidies and tax, uh, tax rebates. Um, for renewables and, and batteries, and, and but also some uh, ones specific to hydrogen, um, up to three dollars a kilogram of, of production, uh, depending on the, the production methodology and its carbon intensity, um, and that's a, that's a huge game changer. It really brings, in theory, a, a green hydrogen project's cost base to, to be very similar to a, a grey hydrogen's cost base. So if a company like Itochu, and, and you know, we don't just op operate in Japan and Australia, we've got uh, businesses uh, and, and offices all over the world. And if we're evaluating you know, a project in a jurisdiction like that versus Australia, then obviously they're, you know. So, so what's your message to the Australian government? <laughs> Have you started conversations with them on that basis? Because that's what's got to happen. Yeah, I, no, I can I tell you the feasibility study, will, what the results will be. You'll need yes. at least 50% government support, I mean, you don't have to spend millions. Yeah. But uh, that, that needs to be, in my view, articulated very early on to the government and, and quote the example of what the states, the US is doing, it's nuts, you know. Yes. We will be left on the back burner and we've said this for years. Yeah. Our main competitors in Australia are the governments. Mm. We've got the wonderful resources, but hey, the economics may not stack up. But yes. anyway, this, yeah. that's, uh, thank you for your answer, sorry, I probably spoke too much there. The other, the other thing I'd like to explore with you, and, and you mentioned the investment with MCI, which is yes. fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're located in the Hunter region. Um, and I think you've got collaboration with Nell, an electrolyzer manufacturer. That's correct, yes. Um, yeah. And you've also got interest in CO2 shipping and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, have, has Itochu considered um, actually manufacturing equipment in Australia? If you... Well, I'm sure you will invest in Australia at some point yes. in time. So you'll need big electrolyzers, you know, gigawatt potentially. Why not build them here um, in the Hunter region, for example, as a skilled yeah. workforce and so forth? And you have presence there too. Uh, have you, has Itochu considered that option? Um, yeah, look, look, certainly something uh, that, that we would consider. I mean, Itochu is not a manufacturing company ourselves, so it's not something you know, we'll, we'll be doing um, uh, with our partners. But we do have uh, a lot of partnerships. You mentioned uh, one with, with Nell, the electrolyzer maker, yep. where we have a global um, strategic partnership, um, certainly with a lot of the Japanese um, heavy industrial companies as well. So um, yeah, we would certainly consider options like that. Mm -hmm. of, of yeah, because I think it's very important for companies like Itochu because it creates jobs. Yes. I mean, you're in coal, and we know you know the future of coal is, yeah. uh, well, in a particular state, yes. um, and so creating more jobs uh, in the Hunter region, for example, or anywhere, or you yeah. look at what Andrew Forrest is doing in yes. Gladstone, he's bringing plug power, electrolyzer yeah. company. So there are other, I would see the great opportunities and you know, bring manufacturing back to Australia. And so we're not reliant on imports as much. It creates yeah. jobs, That's, I think it's, it'd be great if Tochu yeah. could uh, invest on that basis. So yeah. my final question, I think we're running out of time. Mm. Yep. Mm -hmm. A little bit more? Okay. So this is probably a hard one, but it sort of uh, summarizes our initial position that you've described yeah. with the Tochu. Let's just think about only 2030. So mm. it's only seven years away. Yes. So you know what Itochu's presence and footprint looks like now. Yeah. What do you see it to be in 2030? 
Uh, yeah, look, that's a good, good question. Um, uh, we see, uh, certainly in the resources part of the business, you know, we know we invest in, in mining, which is, is carbon intensive. Um, our customers are steel mills and, and power companies and cement companies who also have, um, you know, uh, large carbon footprints. And so we hope that we can be, you know, um, by investing in uh, things like hydrogen and other decarbonisation uh, technologies to help our partners and um, our customers decarbonise. So yeah, 2030, um, yeah, seven so years. How many time. plants are we going to have? How many? I'd, I'd look, look, you what electrolyzers are we going to have? I'd love and where? <laughs> I'd love it if we, we were exporting from uh, you know our project at Dalmapo Bay and, and maybe others and, and selling uh, hydrogen or one of its carriers um, to our customers in Japan and elsewhere. Yeah. I'd love it if we had um, commercial plants for MCI operating in yep. Australia and uh, and Japan and elsewhere. Mm. Um, and I'd love it if, if the mine sites we invest in were also running on, um, yeah, on hydrogen Terrific. Yeah. equipment. No, I, I see it a huge opportunity because Itochu is such a big company. It was $6.3 billion profit last year. So, yes. And you, you're, you're traders, so you own the whole supply chain. The That's hydrogen right, yes. and, supply um, chain and the hydrogen yeah. derivative supply chain, like ammonia and methanol yes. and so forth. So if anybody's going to do it, Companies like Itochu would be right at the forefront, but if you want to prepare to take the risk, yeah. and if it stacks up with appropriate government support. So, personally, I'd love to see something like that, but something needs to be done quickly rather than just this stuff. Yes. Uh, you've got to get on the ground and build. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you very much, Brendan. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Alex. Yeah.